Um, this interview is with Jeremy Karpatkin. It's for the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum. Today is November 11th, 2005, and this interview is being conducted at my home. I am Nancy Nachman Hunt. Um, I guess we'll start at the beginning, Jeremy. Um, mm -hmm. Where were you born? What was your early life like? And uh, uh, what was your education and occupation before you started at Rocky Flats? I was born in 1961 in New York City. Went to New York City Public Schools, Oberlin College in Ohio. And for most of the time between the end of college and starting at Rocky Flats, I worked for politicians and political candidates. For the last six or seven years prior to working at Rocky Flats, I was working for the now deceased Senator Paul Simon from Illinois, uh -huh. ultimately as his chief of staff in Washington, D.C. Okay. Um, so you got to Colorado how? It was purely personal matters. Uh, my wife, who was living in Colorado, and we decided that we wanted to settle in Colorado. So I was looking to move to Colorado, and it was the decision to move to Colorado preceded and it was independent of any consideration of Rocky Flats. Okay. So you kind of came here without a job? I knew I was coming here. Okay. I had made the decision to come here. I had a general time frame from when I would come here, and I was still living in Washington when I was job hunting. I don't think I had, well, I first became aware of the Department of Energy nuclear complex and the challenges posed by the clean, environmental cleanup of that complex probably in early 1989 because that was an issue that was before the Senate Budget Committee. And one of my jobs working for Senator Paul Simon was handling his Budget Committee portfolio. He was on the Budget Committee. Okay. And so I certainly became aware of the cleanup problems, principally from a budget standpoint, uh, as early as February or March of 1989. Okay. I don't think I had any awareness of any specific facility within the complex. I mean, I didn't know Rocky Flats from Hanford from Savannah River, but certainly the idea that the Cold War is over, the unpaid bills are coming due, and one of them is this environmental disaster that no one had really been aware of in any serious way until from my perspective, the late 1980s. So when did you start Rocky Flats then? I started in 1995. I started in February of 1995. And you were generally in charge of the public relations function, or how, how did that work? I was originally hired. My formal title when I started was the Director of Communications and Economic Development. Wow. The Let's e talk about both of those Well, things. I'm not sure how interesting the economic development portion is, because uh, let me start with that one. Okay. There was a notion in the early 90s that part of the future of Rocky Flats lay in economic conversion, economic development. And from my perspective, that was sort of a carryover notion. I think there was a general policy consideration that facilities that used to be supported by either defense missions more broadly or more narrowly Cold War nuclear production could plausibly be converted to civilian use. And the notion was that was a way to keep jobs, to keep infrastructure, mm -hmm. and for there not to be a massive economic harm or dislocation uh, as a result of changes in either national security policies or foreign policy. And there are certainly places in the United States and areas where that was a very viable concept. If you've got a factory in a, in a factory town that's making tanks, and you want to try to reduce the spending on the military, it's reasonable for somebody to think about, all right, is there a way to uh, transform this factory from making tanks to making cars? Right. Uh, and that's certainly a reasonable consideration. And I think there was a premise that as Rocky Flats was in that gray period between, we know we're not making bombs anymore, or to be precise, we're not making pits anymore, but we don't know what we are doing anymore. Is there some way in which economic conversion could be part of the solution. 
what the history has shown us and what my experience bore, bore out is that for a variety of reasons, it was not an important part of the solution. It was not an important part of the future of Rocky Flats. And why is that? Well, uh, several reasons. Probably the most important reason is if you examine the economic role of Rocky Flats in comparison to the broader economy of the Denver metro area, it simply wasn't that big of a factor. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not going to be true of a lot of the larger facilities in Department of Energy locations. The Department of Energy facility will be comparatively larger. The broader economy will be comparatively smaller and less diverse. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the most important reason. Okay. But a second reason, which I think is very important because this relates to other issues that affected Rocky Flats throughout the cleanup period, mm -hmm. the principal concern in the minds of many policymakers, many community leaders, many business leaders during that period of time between the, in the early and mid-1990s and even the late 1980s was a recognition that to the extent that the Denver metro area had a comparative economic advantage vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the country, it lies in the area's image of itself and presentation to the world <coughs> as an area of wilderness is not the right world, but the outdoors, the outside, recreation, and the specific manifestations of that are, well, obviously access to hiking and skiing, but also preserving the vistas, preserving the wildlife, that people can build a home somewhere and see a herd of deer uh, outside their home. And in that context, there was much, much more in concern about suburban sprawl between Denver and Boulder mm -hmm. and the areas uh, west of Denver than there was in how to hang on to jobs. There was a lot more interest in how do we preserve open space areas that are quickly disappearing than there is in how do we preserve buildings that were designed in the 1950s and 1960s. It, the concern was really the other way. Now that being said, it took many years of discussions, work, uh, consultations between the Colorado congressional delegation and the local communities before that came together as a very specific consensus that Rocky Flats should become a wildlife refuge mm -hmm. after the cleanup was over. But the point I'm trying to make is that even in the early 1990s, if you look at the Denver metro area, the economics of the area, the role of Rocky Flats in relation to the economics, the self-image of the region, the policy concerns of the region, it was number one, I think, unique, but number two, predictable, mm -hmm. that that would go in the direction not of economic redevelopment and economic conversion, but in the area of preserving vital open spaces, preserving natural vistas, that that was the bigger concern and that that would really triumph over any consideration of economic development. Now, I could go on. There are also yeah. smaller issues. There was actually a study done. I mean, to try to parse the chronology more closely, it was in 1995 that the Future Site Use Working Group, a community uh, group that came together representing many diverse elements in the community to make recommendations to the Department of Energy about the future use of the site. That group actually recommended economic conversion of some of the facilities. Even though the site was, as they say, hot. Well, the idea was, obviously, the facilities would have to be cleaned up before they could be reused. But there was an idea that some facilities were hotter than others. <laughs> some facilities had actually been less hot, and they had been machine-making facilities. If you clean them up, could they be used for other machine-making capabilities? There was a project uh, for a while that the focus of which was to see if some of those facilities could be used by non-government players to produce components for the civilian nuclear waste industry. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of different considerations going on out there. Uh, and even in, as in 1995, there was still this notion that economic reuse would be part of the answer. And that wasn't really truly disposed of until later in the 90s. In 1997, a second study was done to ascertain whether the economics really justified reuse of any of the facilities. That study concluded it did not. Mm -hmm. And 
then there was a third strand that still had to be worked out, which is even if the facilities don't merit economic reuse, does that mean the land itself doesn't have a value for economic reuse? And that had to be worked out in some detail with some of the neighboring communities before the ultimate conclusion was reached that no, it's really better for all concerned, even for the land, to continue to be open space and not uh, for the purpose of economic reuse. You know, the thing that's, that's interesting to me is I don't think we have a lot of information about that process, so I really appreciate you talking about that, the, the sort of decision as to how it came to be that it would be designated open space or wildlife refuge, mm -hmm. or whatever it turns out to be. Um, in terms of your communications function mm -hmm. at, at Rocky Flats, you, um, if I understand your background correctly, you were here or you were at Rocky Flats only during the cleanup. Phase. That's right. That's right. And so basically the contractor was. I arrived in the last. No, DOE was never the contractor. Was it, was it Kaiser Hill? I arrived in the last two months of EG&G. Okay. And, but I saw enough of what EG&G did to understand the difference between their method of operating and Kaiser Hill's. And one of the first uh, public announcements that I had to manage was the announcement about the new contractor. But one of the things that I've, that I think is important to emphasize is that in the public strategy for Rocky Flats, making one-shot announcements, was almost always less important than trying to communicate more broadly what we're trying to achieve and trying to partner with the community on achieving it. The one-shot announcement was, who is the new contractor going to be? From my perspective, that was much less important than why did DOE believe that the new contract structure had a greater chance for achieving success than the old contract structure? And that was not a one-shot announcement. And so how did you... Well, <clears throat> again, it was not a one-shot deal. It had to, the communications of that was constantly evolving, constantly changing over time. And the single biggest way to communicate it was not by figuring out what talking points to use. And one of the things that's very critical in understanding Rocky Flats is that many of the issues that are characterized as communications issues or process issues. In fact, were not communications or process issues. They were substance issues. The way to communicate that the new contract was superior to the old contract was that under the new contract, we could achieve more real cleanup than the old contract did. Everything else would just be a lot of blah, blah, blah. And that was not a question of communication. That was a question of substance. Were we cleaning up hot spots? Were we moving waste? Were things getting done? Were high-risk drums getting made less high-risk, were liquids that were in a very unstable state made more stable. I mean, it was that is the sort of crux of accountability. And that was not anything that the communication shop to, could do. And one of the things that I tried to bring to the management is if we aren't doing what we said we were going to do, if we're not succeeding, then no communication strategy is going to help us. I mean, if we're getting criticized for not delivering, we deserve to be criticized because we said this new contract structure would lead to better results. Now, it just so happened from a communication standpoint, and there were better results after Kaiser Hill came on board. Uh, so that made it easier to argue that the new contract, at least in some respects, was superior to the old contract. It's obviously not that simple. There were a lot of things that the new contractor was only able to do because of the work the old contractor had done. The new contract wasn't perfect. There were many features of it that were very problematic that had to be jettisoned, resolved, or uh, built upon. Uh, so it, the entire history of the cleanup of Rocky Flats in the 10 years I was there was a, pr was a process of, OK, let's examine this thing. Let's try it out. And we know in the process of trying this out, we will figure out some things about this new approach that work and some that don't. And let's evolve it again, and let's evolve it again. And it was a constant iterative process. And there was no way to know in any single point of decision making where it would lead two or three years from now. And it had to be an iterative experimental process. And I want to be clear, I'm not talking about experimenting on 
safety precautions for workers, but I'm talking about how to incentivize the contractor to truly do what the government wants them to do and how to strike the right balance between giving the contractor the scope to make decisions but not give them so much scope that we lose the essential governmental oversight function. And one thing that's important to clarify is that my job as communications director has sometimes been misunderstood as a PR function. It was not. Or it's not entirely. Because there were several things that I was expected to do, or I did them, regardless of whether I was expected to do them. One, obviously, is the straight, what we called PR, the writing of the press releases, the explaining the decisions, the putting out information, and obviously, to some degree, trying to cast it in a, in a light favorable to the Department of Energy. Uh, but a second thing that's equally important is that my job was making sure that the public processes through which the site engaged the community were truly open and honest and functional processes. And that meant often having to engage with the decision-making apparatus of the site to make sure that the public process and the public and the decision making lined up. And that wasn't easy. That took time. That took years of effort, many false starts. That, that wasn't simple. But a third piece that I think is very critical for people to understand about Rocky Flats is that a site like Rocky Flats or any large DOE site, the smaller ones perhaps less so, but the large ones, cannot be successful with the community if all they do is have a public process that is a good public process. That by itself is insufficient to be successful. The Department of Energy and its decision makers need to understand what it is they want from the community. Mm -hmm. And if their answer is a process answer, that to me is a sign of trouble. Can you give an example sure. of a process answer? A process answer would be, we want from the community their input. So that means we'll be successful if we get a great turnout at this public meeting. We'll have a good meeting if nobody raises their voice and yells. We'll have a good meeting, we'll have a good process if we get hundreds of public comments, including from people who uh, haven't commented before. We will have a good process if all of the cities send in comments and feel like they were given enough time and enough information to give us thoughtful comments. Those are process answers. Okay. And they don't get to the heart of the matter. Right. The heart of the matter is the department or any government decision maker, before they go to the public, I believe, and we tried to practice this at Rocky Flats, I wouldn't argue we were always successful, but they have to understand going in, what is the range of our decision making discretion? So if we have a decision to make about how to deal with special nuclear material, the NEPA process would say we need to put out seven alternatives that bound every plausible answer. But there's a level of unreality if everybody involved truly knows the scope of discretion is over here. Yeah. The law requires we scope it out out to here. But all it does is breed distrust if we say with a straight face we're really open to any solution from here to here when everyone involved knows that we're not. And the department needs to be able to say, look folks, we'll do this because the law requires it. But here's really where the action is. And we can do it this way or this way. And here's why we can't do anything over here. And here's why we can't do anything over here. I'm going to jump around in our questions That's fine. a little That's bit fine. here. But that, and, and I'm going to ask you a question that I didn't pose beforehand, and I apologize for that. But it just occurs to me that in, in what you were just talking about, um, you and Leroy Moore, who was definitely on the other side, so mm -hmm. to speak, developed an interesting relationship, um, at least that's what he told me, and I was wondering if that had, um, when you're talking about the broad range of options, but really the only viable ones are within mm -hmm. this small area, was that something that you and, and Leroy had, had discussions about? I don't want to personalize it to Leroy. Okay. I think for... For anyone watching this years from now, it's inappropriate to get personal. Yeah. 
But let me say that there were certainly people in the community who had a belief that the Department of Energy had more discretion than it had. And that believed that if only the Department of Energy entertained an open process, then they would hear from the community that it wanted an option that was way out on one side. And that it was the Department of Energy's legal and moral duty to then fight for that option up through the system. Even if the Department of Energy knew going in and throughout that it was under no legal obligation to go follow that option. And if it knew that, in fact, there was no discretion to follow that option. And I think that we tried as best we could over the years, and sometimes we did it better than others, to be as honest as we could with the public about what the range of our discretion was. But I would submit that there are people in the community who, in truth, were not angry at us for the range of our discretion. They were angry that our discretion was as narrow as it was. <laughs> yeah. But they didn't understand it that way themselves and didn't articulate it that way. And they tried to argue to us that we were at fault for not, for example, uh, now let me pick a very specific example that I know is a lot of this really became very apparent. The whole question of how much money ought to be spent to remove residual contamination in the soil. The Department of Energy is under, and Rocky Flats was under some obligation to make that decision based on what the law requires, what the regulatory guidance requires. Now there's a range there. It's not one answer, there's a range. But wherever we are on that range, we have to be able to justify it. We have to be able to explain why we're at the range where we're on. That range is based on a set of science. There are people who challenge that science, who think that science is incorrect, who think that science perhaps is even the product of people who are too closely intertwined with the nuclear establishment. So that not only are they wrong about the science, but their uh, support of the science is based on bad intention or, or clouded motives. Well, that may be. But that science is the science that underlies the law and the guidance we're obliged to follow. And if someone wants to come to a public meeting to criticize us for following the science, I'd argue they're barking up the wrong tree. They should write a letter to their congressman and get their congress to get the law changed to make the regulations and policy based on more conservative science. They're free to do that. But they're, they're not going to get satisfied by participating in public meetings with us at our level. It's simply not going to work. Mm -hmm. Second factor that comes into play there is what is the amount of risk reduction one gets for the money? Now, as long as you're in a broad range, and this gets specific to Rocky Flats, as long as you're within the circular risk range, you've got a cleanup that's compliant. The Quest compliant with the law. Right. And for, the, for a variety of reasons that are built into the specific decision at issue. So then the question becomes, where on the range are you and why? And if you want to go beyond the range, for what justification? And there were folks in the community who seemed to believe that the conservative end of the range is, by definition, better. Conservative meaning? More protective. Okay. More protective. That uh, if the question to the community is, do you want a, a, a cleanup that is less protective but saves money, or but more protective but costs more money? If the question is framed that way, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what answer you're going to get. They're going to say, spend more money and give us a more protective cleanup. Now, the problem with that is in the political context of how these decisions are made, Rocky Flats was getting funding ahead of other sites that had more urgent risks. Rocky Flats was getting money that other sites thought they deserved. And why do you think that was? Oh, it's self-evident why that was, because Rocky Flats presented itself to the key players in Congress and to the key players in the administration as a site that could be done on time. Interesting. And that meant that if Rocky was off the books, it would free, off, free up other sites. But part of the logic of that was Rocky had a plan that was a pragmatic plan, that was a protective plan. 
but it was not a plan based on giving everyone in the community everything they wanted. It was a plan that did a, not a perfect cleanup, but a cleanup that met the legal requirements and then some, but not and everything. Mm -hmm. And that was the base for, for which Rocky Flats got funding, consistent funding, steady funding, funding supported by senators and House members who were not from Colorado. And that part of the Rocky Flats story, either I would argue was not recognized, was ignored by many folks in the community who continued to argue, and that's was not everyone in the community, I want to be careful. The community, there's not one community at Rocky Flats. There are a great a large number of individuals, different players, different, uh, different interests. So I'm not saying this is true of everyone, but it was true of some who argued that if only, that if folks came to a public meeting, asked for more money for more cleanup, and Department of Energy then forwarded that request, of course we would get the money. When the political reality was, which we tried to explain to people, in fact, if we make requests we can't justify, the opposite will happen. Right. People will say, well, wait a minute, now you're acting irresponsibly. And that's a signal to us that maybe we shouldn't give you the funding that was part of the understanding of why you're getting funding ahead of other sites. Some people characterize that as a behind closed door, smoke filled room kind of deal that cut the public out. I have several answers to that. One is, <clears throat> I'm not aware of any congressionally funded project that makes itself transparent to the general public. That's in the nature of how Congress funds federal projects. They are done the way they are done, and no official at DOE Rocky Flats has any control of that, nor will they ever. So the question is not, do we, how do we feel about how Congress makes funding decisions? We can feel however we want. They will make the funding decisions they make the way they may want to make them. The question is, what outcome do we want for a project important to our community? That's the question. And I would argue that if you examine where things stood between 1994 and 1997 and where things stood after 97, the difference for this community was remarkable in a positive way. Mm -hmm. That what had been a site that was not getting consistent funding, where we never knew month to month what our funding would be, where States with more powerful congressional delegations were able to take money from the cleanup of Rocky and use them for other sites <laughs> to the 97 time frame where Rocky Flats was getting funded in a consistent way based on a set of priorities and a set of projects that we reached agreement on with the state of Colorado and with the EPA and with a chunk of the community. It was a dramatic turnaround. And, and that period of time was the time that you were working with Kaiser Hill. Kaiser Hill was the contractor. Right. And, yes. And did you report to Kaiser Hill? Was that your boss? No. DOE was your boss? Yes. Okay. Yes. No one who works at the Department of Energy ever reports to Kaiser Hill. Okay. They are two separate and apart entities. Okay. Depart Kaiser Hill works for the Department of Energy. All right. And no, I never, I never reported to Kaiser Hill. Okay. I think that's, that's, uh, Good to, to, to clarify. Um, how, how many people were on your staff at, at the time you were working with Rocky Flats? It declined dramatically. When I got there, there must have been <laughs> at least 20 people on the public affairs side, on the DOE side, and then another 20 on the contractor side, who, although they didn't work for me, uh, in practice, the staffs worked very closely together. As time went on, my staff shrank to the, became much smaller. It was more like eight to 10 for most of the time I was there. Then I think around 1999, my job changed. I was taking, taken off of being public affairs director and made a special assistant first to the site manager and then to the assistant secretary for environmental management. And so from 1999 or 2000, I remember the exact chronology, I had no staff. And it I stopped. Just you. Well, there was a public affairs staff. They didn't report to me okay. Okay. <laughs> because I was working directly for the manager trying to resolve some of these issues. You know, how do we make our public process and our decision making and our communications and collaborations with key folks in Congress and the governor's office and other politicals come together? And I, I know there's a point I want to make that's important. There's an inherent tension 
between the framework of a public process that prioritizes openness and accountability and the framework of understanding what you want and trying to reach some agreement with the community based on your limited discretion. I don't think that any Department of Energy site can be successful without doing both of those things. But at the same time, there's an inherent tension between them. Because one requires operating in complete openness. The other requires negotiating with folks in the community to say something, uh, a negotiation that would look something like if it's important to the community to have more removal of contamination in the first three feet of soil. You need to be willing to allow us to leave some greater contamination behind in the deep subsurface. Given the attitude of distrust that I think characterizes virtually every Department of Energy site, it's very, very hard for any player in the community to be willing to stand up and say, yes, we're willing to give something up to the Department of Energy. We're willing to make a concession. We're willing to negotiate. The reality we found was public negotiations could not work. Now, that's not particularly profound. I think anyone who's ever been involved in any negotiation knows you can't negotiate in public. But what's important for this to understand is that if it's presupposed that your public process has to operate <laughs> within the confines of CERCLA or RICRA or NEPA, well, they all uh, require and presuppose open public processes. Can you, can you define those acronyms? I'm sorry, the National Environmental Policy Act, okay. which is the act that requires a certain public process for a federal agency undertaking any major federal environmental action. RICRA is the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, which is the federal law, and there's a state component as well, that governs the cleanup of hazardous waste, or the management of hazardous waste by ongoing activities, ongoing operations. Mm -hmm. Then there's CERCLA, which is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Liability and uh, Comprehensive Response Legislation. No, it doesn't matter. It's CERCLA, okay. uh, and that's the federal law that governs environmental cleanup of, of contaminated sites. There were others. We were governed by the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. I mean, I mean, I just hit the top three, but there's an entire alphabet soup of acronyms federal and state laws that governed us and that we had to try to comply with as we went forward. Those laws all presume that they, they circumscribe how the Department of Energy undertakes a public process, not just the Department of Energy, any federal agency. But that framework is different from the framework that I urged the managers and the assistant secretary to take, and I think any successful manager or assistant secretary would take, which is to say, OK, what is the range of our discretion? What do we need to be successful? Who are the players in the community whose interests are most important to us? And how do we work with them to achieve some commonality of interest with them, knowing we can't make everybody happy? Now, we could just decide to follow the public process method, which is we do our public meetings, we get the formal comments, we review those public comments on our own. We decide in a vacuum which of those public comments we'll accept and which ones we won't based on their technical merit. I don't know on what basis. And then we'll put out our final product, brace ourselves, not knowing who we will have made, who we will have satisfied or who we will have not. That's absurd. Even to, to put it out that way is absurd. The smart way to do it is to have some understanding during the public process, OK, what are the cities looking for out of this cleanup? What are the peace organizations looking for out of this cleanup? What are the environmentalists looking for out of this cleanup? Do these people understand what's achievable? Who do we care most about? Who are the players who have been most engaged in this cleanup? Who represents the most people? And on some basis, strike some balance and make some self-conscious decision about what our final decision will look like. Let me stop you just for a minute, because what what First, I want to ask you, when you say the community, mm -hmm. what communities are you talking about? Boulder, Arvada, yes. Jefferson County? I'm talking principally about the seven communities that were physically contiguous to Rocky Lake. Yes. And when I say communities, let me be more precise, seven entities of local government. Okay. There was Boulder County and Jefferson County, City of Arvada, City of Westminster, City of Broomfield, 
city of Boulder, town of Superior. Those were the seven communities that were seven units of local government that were physically contiguous to Rocky Flats. I don't want to suggest that those were the only ones we cared about because the city of Louisville was interested in certain issues, city of Thornton, city, city of North Glen, there were certain issues the city of Golden was interested in. Uh, there were others who came into play at various points, but typically when officials at Rocky Flats talk about the local governments, we're talking about the seven contiguous local governments, all of whom starting I believe in 1998, it might have been 1999, came together as part of the Rocky Flats Coalition of Local Governments and hired a staff, met monthly, had an ongoing interaction with the site, both in, in terms of exchanging information and participating in our public processes, and quite frankly, having less official discussions about this is what our members' interests are, this is what we're trying to achieve, and to try to work with us to see if those interests could be accommodated as the cleanup went forward. Sorry to have interrupted, because right. you, you, were, you were talking about how you thought things ought to have gone in the communication process during your tenure. Yeah. Um, how did they end up? How did they end up going? Well, I would say that they evolved and that it took us, it took me, no, I'm going to speak personally, a while to sort of recognize that there was a difference between the public process paradigm and the negotiation paradigm and that, that there was a tension there and that we needed to pr pursue both of them. Uh, that took a while. I mean, I mean, let me back up. The first challenge was even to get the public process paradigm right. And even before that, the first challenge was to get openness right. I mean, it's important to roll the clock back a little bit here. Right. The Department of Energy had a decades-long history, not just of secrecy, but also of the notion of we are not accountable to the state and federal regulators because those state and federal laws don't apply to us. Now, even though through most of my, my time there, that formally was behind us, really making openness and legal accountability stick and making that work was the first challenge. And it's important to recognize that the first moment openness, the openness initiative came into effect and the first several years that the site recognized that yes indeed we are accountable to state and federal regulators. It took a while for those relationships to become functional as opposed to dysfunctional because the immediate environment in which it occurred was one of not just distrust but antagonism. I mean hostility. Distrust doesn't quite characterize it. We're talking about overt sort of livid hostility can, and, and, and overcoming that took years. Can you give me some sort of a, an anecdotal Here's one that I was told. I can't give this one firsthand because I didn't okay. see it. But there were stories that have been borne out that when f environmental regulators needed to inspect a RICRA tank in a building, because the RICRA tank that was regulated was regulated inside of a building that was a nuclear production building that they otherwise had no right to access to, the state, I don't, I don't remember if it was a state or a federal regulator, but the regulator would have to be blindfolded and escorted in with armed guards is the story I was told. Now, without passing judgment as to whether that was or was not necessary at the time, or whether there was or wasn't a better way, it's that sort of thing that creates such an attitude of distrust that once that regulator finally, after years of that, re realizes that they finally have the power to enforce state laws, to enforce uh, uh, compliance, they're not exactly going to be magnanimous or gracious about it. I mean, that's human nature. And all I'm suggesting is to sit here and talk about the public process paradigm or the, the, the negotiations paradigm is my expressing what we were thinking about in the 2003-2004 time frame. That was not the question in 1995. <laughs> that's really what I'm trying to communicate that in 1995 we had much more fundamental issues we had to get over first. Uh, a big one that I personally had to deal with was, and this may sound simple in, in talking about it now, making sure that our public processes lined up with the actual decision making. Mm -hmm. Now that seems self-evident, but I've 
it's important for people to understand that when you're looking at a site that's regulated by six or seven different laws, each of which have their own decision-making uh, rationales to them, and each of which have conflicting requirements for what's got to happen, and each of which has requirements for a public process. And then you have a set of federal employees whose job it is to execute that public process and only that public process. And what do they do? They hire subcontractors whose job it is to execute that public process and only that public process according to the requirements of that law and only that law. And they then reach out to the community. And they then develop clients in the community who are wedded to that public process and only that public process. So there, when I first arrived at Rocky Flats, there were the following processes, all of which are articulated to the community, presented themselves to the community as the global process that defined the future of the site. There was the Future Site Use Working Group, which was not uh, based on any federal or state law. It was simply a DOE initiative. There was what was called the Baseline Environmental Management Report that attempted to figure out <coughs> what the costs would be of cleaning up the entire complex. There was the Rocky Flats cleanup agreement process. Now, even though that was a negotiation of a tripartite regulatory agreement, nevertheless, there were public meetings. There was a sense of accountability to the public. And that uh, the RIFCA claimed to speak to the broad question of how would Rocky Flats get cleaned up and according to what criteria. There was what was at the time called the site-wide environmental impact statement which was an attempt to do a global NEPA evaluation of the entire site, including cleanup activities. There was, I'm not done yet. Uh, <laughs> oh, there was an initiative launched by the contractor, by Kaiser Hill, that was called uh, Accelerated Site Action Plan, a bold proposal to clean up the site in six years. All of these were going on simultaneously. All of them had public meetings. And not a single one of them could articulate what their relationship was to the others. And it was in that environment that I was told, you need to implement the openness initiative as public affairs director. And it quickly became clear to me that simply being open and telling the truth is not going to be helpful. That alone is not going to get, make us effective. Because we're coming across like a bunch of buffoons here. Not because we're being dishonest. Not because we're hiding anything. but. The truth that we're revealing to people is an embarrassing truth because it bespeaks such fundamental incompetence in how we make decisions. Talk about right hand, left hand. Oh, it was, and, and again, just to emphasize, each of these initiatives had clients in the, among the federal employees who were committed to that process, clients at headquarters who would do bureaucratic battle in defense of their particular initiative, Subcontractors, many of whom were politically connected in the community to politicians, politically connected lobbyists, and particular patrons in the community who felt that they had a fail, developed a relationship with the contractors and feds working that particular process. So if that process were shut down, their interests would get hurt. So if you tried to shut down one process, you can count on getting pushback from headquarters, pushback from the contractors, and angry letters from the community. So, so this was the reality in 1995. And, oh, in addition to that, Rocky Flats had made a commitment, I don't know to who or why, to hold monthly public meetings. Just generically. That anyone could attend. Which is, pub public meetings that anyone can attend are fine. I, I support that. But they were not tethered to a decision. We're not holding a public meeting to get your input onto this decision which fits into the cleanup in this way. We're just holding monthly public meetings because it's part of our public involvement plan to hold a public, monthly public meeting. And it doesn't matter that these other five or six processes all have their own monthly public meetings. No, this is the Rocky Flats monthly public meeting. And I haven't begun to describe all the interactions of the community. I'm just describing the ones that claim to be the big picture ones. Then there were all the little picture ones. Give me that an weren't. example of a little picture. Oh. In 1994, there was an evaluation done of the, all of the facilities in the complex, all the nuclear facilities, to figure out which ones were the most vulnerable, the greatest safety issues. Rocky Flats was found to have had two or three of the 10 most vulnerable facilities, which I think was a, a, a particular euphemism for unsafe. Mm -hmm. 
And so appropriately, the management at the department, both at Rocky Flats and at headquarters, determined that there needed to be a plan for how to address that. So two rounds of public involvement then ensued. One was briefing the community on this report and what it meant, and then regularly reporting back to the community on how we were fixing the problem. So there had to be regular meetings, both public meetings, interactions with the Citizens Advisory Board, and individual meetings with the cities regarding how we were deal addressing the plutonium vulnerabilities. Another report came out that showed that a, the facility where most of our plutonium was stored needed upgrades if it was going to be a permanent plutonium storage facility. We held a public process to ascertain whether it would be smarter to upgrade that building, build a whole new building, or plan to disposition the plutonium somewhere else. That involved, I don't, I'm not going to try to quantify it, but a significant number of public interactions over the narrow question of what do we do with the plutonium and do we do, what do we do with it in the short run, the medium run, the long run. Once again, independent of these self-proclaimed global discussions, there were others. There was a low-level mixed waste focus group that was trying to fi div figure out how we would deal with mixed waste. There were uh, all sorts of public processes about the transuranic waste to whip. When I tried to, and here's just one, one small example, minimize the amount of interaction we were going to do with our community about how wonderful this facility in New Mexico was, because I thought, frankly, given everything else we have going on, who really cares? And can we just limit this to the affected people and not do a vast public process? I got pushback and resistance from the folks down in Carlsbad saying, how dare this you not do this as a big, vast public process? That was the culture of the Department of Energy. Yeah. And the thing, the thing that I, that's important, though, is the community didn't object to this. That, that's very important for people to understand. Most people in the community thought this was just fine. Because they saw it as, frankly, I'll be cynical about it, but I think this is right. They saw it as having multiple opportunities to get at us and to uh, use one process against another process. That kind of incoherence served the interests of many folks in the community. So, <laughs> in a sense, I'm hearing that your, your community relations function, your director of communications and interactions with the community was a, was a much larger part of your daily functions than dealing one-on-one -on -one with the press. Would that be? Oh yeah, I, I, that's absolutely true. Okay. That is, I mean, but again, they're not unrelated. I mean, <laughs> where did the press get most of their stories from? The community. <laughs> and the community had access, to, for many years, had ex better access to information about Rocky Flats than I did. They were able to find out sooner and better what was going on at the site in many instances that I could. And if they saw, thought it would serve their interest, they'd feed it to a reporter. Did a reporter, did reporters ever come back to you? Oh, sure. For the official comment, an hour before they filed their story. And <laughs> Sure. I mean, we, I, I, again, I'm talking about what I was encountered when I first got there. Right. I mean, we were able to, to overcome that by working with people, by... Uh, I mean, we, we were able to put in place mechanisms to, to overcome that over time. But I'm again describing what I found in 95, 96. Right. And, and I mean, it got better. <laughs> it did get better. And, and during that evolution, um, I guess, there, was there a particular organization, whether it be a news organization or a community or, or a community of interest, that seemed to continually be part of this dialogue? Part of it in a positive way or in a negative way? I'm not quite sure I grasped well, your question. Well, either one. Either one. Um, for example, uh, Did the Boulder County or the city of Boulder or Arvada or was, was there? I would not say that there was any one sort of transcendent group. Every group participated, many of the ones you mentioned and others, in a consistent way. But 
it tended to be on issues or themes that were particularly important to them. And there was not, I cannot attribute this sort of completely dysfunctional situation to the behavior of any one group. I mean, if I had to attribute it to the behavior of one group, I would say the principal group that is culpable is the United States Department of Energy. We, we created this mess, and it was up to us to fix it. And I don't mean the mess in terms of the environmental contamination. Right. I, and I don't even mean the legacy of secrecy. I mean, that, that, those two are sort of self-evident. But even the situation where we had six conflicting processes going on at the same time, we created that. Nobody did that to us. We did that to ourselves. Now, in fairness, we also fixed it by ourselves. And, and that's <laughs> What I'd like we to did, talk we did. about next. Well, I mean, I mean, one way, one very critical way in which we fixed it is that to talk about all these processes, if I had to pick one out that looms above the others is the most important for a variety of reasons. It would have to be the regulatory agreement with the state and the EPA, the Rocky Flats Cleanup Agreement, it's the RIFCA. That did many things. It streamlined the decision process and clarified the decision process. It basically said for the purpose of how the site is going to decide what it's going to clean up, there will be one process. Now, if the site wants to entertain all these silly dialogues with the public that are inconsistent, the site's free to do that. But in terms of what is legally required to get a cleanup action done, RIFCA will govern that, one document. It streamlined the number of pressure points the state and EPA had over the site. It institutionalized the idea of we're going to hold you accountable, you DOE, to achieving these few big goals. If you don't meet them, you're going to get nailed. But we're not going to micromanage how you meet them. We're no longer going to hold you accountable to getting a report out, getting a draft report out, getting a draft draft report out. No. You need to move this amount of waste. If you move it, you're in compliance. If, you're not, if you haven't, you're not. So who drafted RIFCA? It took years of negotiating. It wasn't drafted okay. at one time. It took years of painful, painful negotiating. And it almost wasn't a success. I mean, in terms of the document, once we got there, was a success. But getting there, at many moments, it looked like we would not get there. And a lot of very well-intentioned people were involved in that process. And it's a credit to them that they pulled it off. But it was staff at the state, staff at EPA, staff at the Department of Energy. Kaiser Hill, toward the end, had a complex but positive role. Folks in the governor's office were very helpful. Folks in the attorney general's office. So many of the same people we battled with earlier in the decade, we worked through that battling and came together to forge the RIFCA. And the RIFCA needed, even after it was written, it was constantly interpreted, amended, uh, improved. So it's not like the RIFCA as it exists today is the same RIFCA as it was written in 1990, it's approved in 96, I believe. Written in the, the, the drafting of it started in the 1994 time frame, I think. But that was enormously helpful because it also prescribed certain public processes also. So that was a start. It also established that the regulators in the Department of Energy had to coexist both as adversaries across the table and as partners around the table. It basically institutionalized that dual role. Now, for many people, that was hard. It was, I mean, how can we play that dual role? Is that a conflict of interest? How is that going to work? And it's a credit to some of the individuals involved that they were able to see their way through to play that dual role and do it effectively. So I think that was enormously important, enormously important that we were able to get that going because it enabled and required the state and EPA to represent to the community this is what we're responsible for under RIFCA. Mm -hmm. And we're responsible for reporting back to the community, has the Department of Energy complied with RIFCA? And if they've done so, we're going to say so. If they haven't, we're not. But they didn't have an open-ended brief to say, well, because we're angry about being blindfolded 10 years ago, we're going to engage in some kind of retaliatory behavior. Similarly, the Department of Energy no longer had the excuse under RIFCA, or it was considerably constrained to say, oh, we would like to comply, but headquarters has pulled our funding back, so we can't. A key issue that RIFCA was able to not resolve, but box in and sort of lessen considerably was a very 
difficult problem that confronts every Department of Energy site. And I've got to digress a little bit into environmental law here because there's no way to get to this point without getting there. Even today, the federal environmental laws do not address the nuclear material. They are barred under the Atomic Energy Act from addressing the nuclear material. So the EPA cannot... They cannot directly regulate the nuclear material at Department of Energy sites. Now that's a one sentence statement. It's obviously much, much more complex than that. But it's essentially accurate. So if you look at most Department of Energy sites, and this is certainly true of Rocky Flats at the time, if you look at where most of the money is, most of the risk is, most of the cost of maintaining facilities, it's all about the nuclear material. The environmental contamination in terms of risk to the workers, risk to the public, and cost of cleanup is a tiny piece of it. But that's the piece they have the power to regulate. That's the power, the piece that they can go after. To make things more complicated, there is an, a, an entity called the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board that doesn't have statutory authority to regulate nuclear safety, but has, it's, it was established by the president in the late 80s, I think. It makes recommendations to the president, and the political reality is that their recommendations always get accepted. So what that means, if you're trying to achieve regulatory coherence, and to try to have a unified global approach to the cleanup of a site, you're faced with the conundrum that the legally enforceable piece is the small piece. The legally unenforceable piece is the big piece. <laughs> wow. So. It was an enormous problem throughout the Rifkin negotiations. And I, there are probably other people you can interview who can speak with more authority than I can about what precisely enabled the Department of Energy at Rocky to get over that. But what we finally agreed to is that we would give the state and the EPA the authority to set, to prescribe activities related to nuclear material that would be publicized as the regulatory goals for those activities and that they would publicly hold us accountable for meeting those goals, understanding that they didn't have the legal authority to take any action if we failed to meet them. They could embarrass us, they could humiliate us, but that was about it. That, folks were skeptical as to whether that approach would work. Hold that sure. thought. Sure. I'm going to have to turn off the, the okay. recorder right now and change the tape. So we'll be changing the tape and uh, see you in a minute. November 11th, 2005, this interview is for the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum. This is the continuation of our interview. Uh, Jeremy, you uh, were talking about the Rocky Flats, can you give the acronym? Rocky Flats Cleanup Agreement, the RIFCA. What I wanted to say is that Something important started happening at about the time I first arrived at Rocky Flats. And it might have been happening before I got there. It's hard to know. But it certainly was an important trend when I arrived. And that was there was a recognition that the status quo was untenable, that the fixed costs of the site were rising, the budget was declining, that Colorado at the time did not have a congressional delegation with the clout to get the kind of funding that other sites were getting. I mean, this is mid-1990s we're talking about. Yes. And the battles with the community and the battles with the regulators had gotten to a point where gridlock would really characterize what was happening. No real work was going on, and every month there'd be some other problem at the site that some Band-Aid was put on, but it was impossible to achieve clarity on anything. And it was killing us. And everybody was beginning to recognize that. And there was an understanding that a path forward needed to be found. Everyone understood that over time. I mean, the, the local governments, the activists, <clears throat> the Department of Energy, the regulators. And out of that recognition, I think, came some of the positive things that were in the RIFCA. I think out of that recognition came uh, a recognition by the community that there had to be a priority on the plutonium first. 
there were buttons that were circulated at the time. This is you know two years after Clinton was elected that said it's the plutonium stupid. <laughs> and the message there was, can we stop arguing about waste management or environmental contamination? Because that stuff doesn't pose a today risk. It's not a worker risk. It's not going anywhere. Whereas the plutonium today is killing us. Not, I don't want to be misunderstood. Plutonium was not killing people, but the plutonium, the amount of money it was costing to prevent the plutonium from, and the facilities containing them from degrading further to the point where it would become an immediate worker risk was fast approaching. And every month it took more and more money to maintain what was called a safety envelope. That is to keep these facilities safe. Safe for workers, safe to, and... And this is post-production. Yes. No production. No production. And this is not about getting the plutonium stabilized and shipped out. This is about maintaining the status quo until we can decide what to do with the plutonium. So this is pure status quo maintenance. Every month, it's costing us more. And that's money that's going away from other stuff. And it's important to understand what was going on in the United States Congress at the time. 1994 was the year of the contract with America. The Republicans took over the House of Representatives. There's not a partisan thing, it's a substance thing. Part of their agenda was eliminating government agencies. One of the agencies on their hit list was the Department of Energy. Now, in that context, there was a fear that if every six months the Department of Energy at Rocky Flats comes up with, oh, we need $40 million more, or else we're going to have an urgent health risk at Rocky Flats. But nobody can come up with a plan. No one says, but when the Congress says, well, what's your plan for being done? And everyone just stares at their shoes. What immediate option presents itself? Well, wait a minute. What's the cost if we don't clean up the site? Leave it as it is. Put up a big fence. What will that cost us? That question was asked. What was the answer? A lot less than what it's costing right now. A lot less. And the other, in other words, let's not bother for cleanup. All we're doing is chasing our tail. Let's simply declare the site a nuclear ghost town, make the minimum, do the minimum stuff we have to do so that no one outside gets hurt. Get all the workers out of there, not do cleanup, to clear the site off limits. Then 20 or 30 years from now, we'll come back and take a look. Once either we've got better technology or better management techniques or something. That was floated as a serious policy option. In Washington. And we had to do some drills. We were told to prepare some issue papers and do some numbers crunching on that. That was seriously entertained. So in that context, there was a notion that, look, however much we fight with each other here in Colorado, <laughs> we do have a common interest in making this site safer and cleaner. And we need to figure out what we can agree on in the short run. I and mean, it led to two things. One, we need to agree on, figure out what we can agree on in the short run to get that done right. and not let our disagreements over the long term prevent us from coming to some agreement on the short run issues. So that was the thing that came out of that sense of crisis. A second thing was we've got to stop distrusting each other so much because that distrust is part of the gridlock. We've got to figure out a way, a mode of operating that gives us enough room to try to get some of these things done. And I'd say that was incorporated into the RIFCA. And a third thing that it did was Let's see if we can work together vis-a-vis -vis Washington in order to argue for more funds or for consistent funding. So that's very important. And everybody in the Rocky Flats who worked in Rocky Flats that I can recall was part of that. People, people who I disagreed with dramatically on other issues, but there was a recognition that, no, we need to come to some agreement on some of this stuff or else the outcome is going to be worse than any of us can imagine. And RIFCA was passed in what year? 96, I believe, it was finally enacted. It was ne the negotiations for it began in possibly as early as 93. So it was a three-year... There was a previous yeah. regulatory agreement. Right. That was called the interagency agreement. And there was an understanding that that was completely dysfunctional. That was useless. It was not achieving anything. So there was a recognition. We needed to re replace it with something else. And it, and it took three, years. Yeah. It might have been two years. I, I mean, I, I got there at the end of that process. And my role, I was not a regulatory person. 
and I was not a techie. So my job was only on one or two pieces of it. I was involved in drafting the vision statement, in drafting the preamble, and even the idea, and we think about it now, of having a attaching to a regulatory agreement a set of goals. Now it seems self-evident. Well, if you're going to have a regulatory agreement, you should put there somewhere what goals you're trying to achieve. At the time, no regulatory agreement had a set of goals. The regulatory agreement was only intended to be how do we synthesize the procedural requirements of the environmental laws. That was what was intended to be. It was at Rocky Flats that we said, well, wait a minute, maybe what we really need is an affirmative vision of what we're trying to achieve through this and attach that to the RIFCA. Did the RIFCA have as part of its vision that the area would become a wildlife refuge? No, but it okay. did have a vision that it would be open space or managed industrial use. It did not get rejected residential use. So that was, that was clearly in the RIFCA, that there would not be residential reuse of, the, of Rocky Flats. For what reason? Well, the principal reason was that nobody wanted residential use. The Future Site Use Working Group that had finished its work in the middle of the RIFCA process had rejected residential use. They had called for, they had called for a cleanup goal that said clean up to background in the long run, once it became technically feasible. Clean up to background meaning background radiation? Yes, meaning that the, the Future Site Use Working Group finished its work in 1995 and involved some of the same agency staff who worked on the RIFCA, recommended that the eventual goal of the cleanup should be to have a site cleaned up sufficiently so that it didn't contribute any additional radiation besides the radiation you'd get just from living in Colorado. That was the goal, that long-term goal. And I want to be fair, only once it becomes financially and technologically feasible. But nevertheless, the long-term goal could be 100 years off. That was the goal. Then there were intermediate goals established. The Future Site Use Working Group <coughs> distinguished between a cleanup goal and a future use goal. Their future use prescribed, and I don't have the report in front of me, so I don't remember in great detail, but was a combination based on chronology and area of environmental research, potential economic reuse, and managed open space, or unrestricted open space, depending on the area and the time frame, but not housing. <laughs> it rejected housing development. And the idea was nobody wants housing development here because the site had been preserved from public access for 40 years. It had some unique habitat that ought to be preserved. And that economic reuse was appropriate because some communities should have their losses protected from the loss of rocky flats. And there are certain facilities there that could be reused without damaging habitat because they're already there. Mm -hmm. So that was the balance that they attempted to strike. Mm -hmm. The drafters of the RIFCA tried as best they could to borrow the future use recommendations from the Future Site Use Working Group, not the cleanup recommendations, though because the cleanup recommendations were not tethered to the legal requirements, and the Rocky Flats cleanup agreement was fundamentally a legal compliance agreement. Right. But the future use provisions were adapted to the extent possible. And I even believe, think, if you were to check the RIFCA, there are even specific references to the future site use working group. It even says so, that uh, consistent with the recommendations of the future site use working group. So the, I think that's explicitly referenced. But it didn't say <laughs> wildlife refuge. Wildlife refuge was an initiative that came from Congress, and specifically from Senator Allard and Congress from Utah. And that was their proposal. Uh, but I mean, do we want to spend a few minutes on that whole strand right now? Or is that, that's a strand unto itself? Well, why not? <laughs> and then after we finish that, let's kind of go back chronology okay. at Rocky Flats. So, sure, go I'll ahead. try to be as succinct as I can on this. By the mid-1990s, based on the report of the Future Site Youth Working Group, based on the RIFCA, and based on individual decisions made by the local government surrounding Rocky Flats, there was already a fairly strong consensus that the site other than the core 185 acres should be open space once the cleanup was over. And what's more, that was not a particular, particular difficult conclusion to come to. Because for a variety of 
And everybody basically thought that was common sense. That was smart. Didn't there were a couple of outliers. The city of Arvada had some concerns about reuse. They thought they would get hit the hardest economically by the loss of rocky flats. So they had some interest in developing pools of the potential interest and didn't want to rule those out. There was a strong consensus behind some form of open space preservation of the site post cleanup. No consensus on was what form it would take. Would it be of Colorado? Would it be through some uh, memorandum of agreement among the local governments? Would it be by the federal government? By the federal government in some particular form? I mean, there was no consensus, and frankly, there was no urge to press the issue because people thought, even in the most optimistic scenario, it's five or ten years off, at least, more like ten at best, perhaps, and why, why engage in brain damage? We all agreed that open space and not housing and not economic reuse, there was no urgency. From my perspective, the urgency began when Secretary Richardson, uh, Richardson in 1990, I think, was it, I don't know if it was 90, but I, I could be wrong, in called Rocky Flats, that he was on an initiative around the country to give DOE land to federal land management agents. And he was coming in three weeks. And a way to transfer some land. I was informed by my then boss that we need to do this right away. She didn't want to hear that it wasn't possible. We were going to... boss was... Jesse Robert. Okay. And... It couldn't just be PR. It had to be, it had to be an actual land transfer. <laughs> the details weren't important, but we did, in fact, arrange for a co-management agreement with the United States Fish and Wildlife for 800 acres in the northern part of the site that we dug Rock Creek Reserve. And it's a beautiful swath of land. It's where the old uh, Lindsay Land and beautiful vista. And we had a wonderful event of energy and number of public officials. I mean, it was, in fact, the Fish and Wildlife Service took over management responsibility for that parcel of land at that time. 1998. I mean, if I could pull my files and remember, I want to say 98. I just don't remember. Okay. Uh, it might even be, sorry, I just don't That's remember. Okay. Uh, uh, but coming out of that, uh, many folks in the community or some folks in the community. It conveyed to me, while it was happening and afterwards, that they felt a little bit abused by this. That the decision about how open Rocky Flats ought to be managed by what entity should be fiat by the Secretary of Energy. There ought to be some dialogue locally. I don't disagree with them at all. I mean, I work for the Secretary, so I don't know, but I can't argue with that. Well, they were the only Way, Congressman Udall came to the same conclusion. And so he decided to get out ahead of this and began drafting legislation to address this issue. And he was talking to the local governments and talking to others in the community, trying to shape a piece of legislation that would manage everyone's interest, that would address that precise question of how and in what way will the Rocky Flats site be managed post cleanup. Senator Allard obviously was monitoring that process, and because he had had experience with the uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal, where I guess they had uh, enacted a law making that a wildlife refuge, he believed that that was the most effective solution. So he drafted a bill that was different than Udall's bill that specifically said it shall be a wild national wildlife refuge managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, he and Udall collaborated, and they developed a singular bill that still retained the feature of the, making it a refuge. And there were many discussions with the community and a lot of work and a lot of dialogues with the Department of Energy also. But our feeling was we wanted to be cooperative with whatever the Colorado delegation came up with. We didn't have strong feelings. They, you know, there were particular provisions that we had some concerns about that we spoke to them about, but nothing fundamental.
And U uh, Congressman Udall and Senator Allard got together on this. They introduced it. They got it passed as part of a provision of the defense authorization bill in 2001, I think. And that's how it happened. And I believe that by the time they got it passed, they had a pretty strong consensus in the community behind that bill. Yeah. And I, I think there were some issues earlier on, but by the time it passed, there wasn't a whole lot of opposition. And there was nothing about it that was inconsistent with anything we were doing. So our feeling was as long as they were willing to talk to us and work with us to make sure that they didn't inadvertently throw some requirement in there without knowing it that would impact us. Right. So that's the short story of how it happened. Obviously, a lot of brain damage was necessary along the way. But that's essentially how that, that, that came together. Um, let's back up for a minute. You came to the site as communications director, yes. Your the majority of your time, other than trying to field those last minute phone calls from reporters, um, was to interface with community groups and and be sort of a, a DOE liaison, if you will. I would frame it slightly differently. Okay. Because I would say that was part of my job, but part of my job was also pushing within the system to create a public process that would work. Okay. And I want to be very clear, I wasn't doing that because the community demanded it. The community was just fine with the dysfunctional system we had. <laughs> they thought it was just great. And, and you said, um, actually I was reminded that you said that in 1999 mm -hmm. your position changed. Yes. Can you talk about that? I was moved from being public affairs director, and I say that generically, I don't remember what my precise title was, but that was functionally what it was, to being special assistant to, uh, first to the site manager. And that was, I think, in 90, 99, I think that was. And the site manager was? Jesse Roberson. Still, okay. And in essence, she found that so much of the priorities and the projects and the activities that were important to her <laughs> involved thinking through the public strategy. You know, how is the press going to react to this? How are the editorial boards going to react to this? How do we get this through the congressional delegation? How do we get this through the bureaucracy? Uh, how do we get this through the regulators? How do we get this through the politicians who are the bosses of the regulators? That so much of what she did involved that cluster of issues that it was more important for me to be working those issues at the substantive level and not just at the process level. That she wanted my input at the front end of any question that would implicate those issues. And at the time, everything we did implicated those issues. And so I ended up spending much more time on the policy making side and less on the details of what our public interactions were. Now, now in fairness, I want to be clear, it wasn't a qualitative change. Because even in my old job, my role was evolving into that. Mm -hmm. I remember there were weeks spent more time outside of her office, camped out on the phone outside of her office, doing stuff for her than I did back in my own office working with my staff. And so in part it was simply, let's recognize reality. The fact is, you're not spending your time doing staff evaluations. You're not spending your time approving the training uh, uh, requests from your staff. You're not doing that. It's neglected. It's sitting up on your desk. You're never going to get to that. <laughs> you're spending all your time taking care of these projects for me. Let's stop killing ourselves and create a job where you'll do projects for me. Yeah. And that's what happened. And the, the, uh, what I said before about Rock Creek Reserve is an example of that. Because she literally moved me into an office outside of her office to manage that. Right. Uh, I mean, there are other examples I could give you that, of high profile thing activities that fall into nobody's uh, direct responsibility. Uh, we had to negotiate uh, an easement with the utility company, and it created all kinds of problems. And the site manager, was a later site manager at the time, asked me to take it over because it looked like it was going to become a huge political brawl. And it wasn't enough to deal with the political brawl. Management understood that you couldn't have one person dealing with the political brawl, but somebody else dealing with what decisions got actually made. The same person had to be doing both, otherwise the political brawl couldn't get resolved. And there were a number of issues like that over time that, that became my responsibility. Um, so in that new 
world. How long were you at Rocky Flats? I was in that role from 1999 to about 2002 when I started law school. And I continued in that role, but I went to a half-time status. Okay. So from 2002 to 2005, that set of duties remained the same, with one important difference, which I'll get to in a minute. But I did it half-time, because I was in law school full-time. And uh, I was still on the phone a lot in between classes, and I had a laptop. <laughs> so I was working, <laughs> working these issues from law school, the law school cafeteria. Uh, the important difference is that in 2000, again, I'm going to get the year wrong. It was either 2002 or 2003. My boss, Jesse Roberson, left Rocky Flats had another federal position, and then shortly thereafter became the Assistant Secretary for Environmental Management. So she became my boss's boss and the head of the whole cleanup program. She invited me to work in Washington as one of her assistants. For various reasons, I, was, I couldn't move to Washington. Then she proposed that I work as one of her assistants, but not move to Washington. And so I became a special assistant to the Assistant Secretary, or Senior Advisor, I think my title was, but still based at Rocky Flats. And so half of my portfolio became doing stuff for her in Washington and working on national cleanup programs, national activities. But I continued to do about, spend about half my time doing Rocky Flats work. And the Rocky Flats work wasn't that different than what it had been. I, was, I just spent less of my time on it. Um, and you ended your employment at Rocky Flats in? July. July, okay. July 2005. Yes. But because you kind of, evolved into this more global position. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of whether or not the way the cleanup and the community <laughs> input process of all of that evolved with Rocky Flats, does that become a model for other DOE sites? Or was there something special about Rocky Flats that required its own legislation in its, its own way of managing this transfer? I think that's some of both. There were a couple things about Rocky Flats that make it unique. One we talked about at the very beginning, and that is the economic realities of the site in the greater Denver metro area. Mm -hmm. And that's important for a very key reason. Because one thing we haven't talked about is that even though there was a lot of disagreement, mm -hmm. there was not dis a whole lot of disagreement on one essential point, and that is this site has got to get cleaned up. On that, there was agreement. We might have disagreed as to the how, the goals, uh, even to the point of people questioning other people's motives. All of that certainly went on. But no one in the community ever could look at a DOE official in a leadership position in a straight face and say, what you're really trying to do is bring nuclear production back here. Right. <laughs> I mean, that was off the table. Nobody suggested that, and, and it wasn't true. And similarly, we could not say to folks in the community, what you're really trying to do is bring back nuclear production. That's your real agenda. So there was an understanding that whatever else was going on, we all agreed with cleanup. That's very important because there are large DOE sites where there are significant interests that don't want to see the cleanup succeed. They want to see the economic base and the jobs continue forever. Mm -hmm. That's really hard to overcome, and it's not clear to me what the Rocky Flats experience has to offer sites in that position. But for sites who, where there really is an understanding, OK, we want to get cleaned up. Yeah. We really do. And we really have a consensus. Well, at that point, I think there are some positive lessons that Rocky Flats can offer. It's very, well, the idea that you really try to make the public processes correspond to the actual decisions that the Department of Energy and its contractor try to focus in on what is the true discretion we have, to, uh, we have and to be frank with the community about that and then to not be shy about engaging in negotiated decision making with the community parallel to the public processes and to not be afraid of somebody accusing you of deal making. I mean, the fact is deals get made all the time. Everybody knows that. <laughs> I mean, I had to laugh when I was accused of deal-making once during my time there. And the, again, I'm not going to mention names, but what made it laughable is that the entity that accused me of deal-making, because they weren't part of this particular deal, had itself 
initiated deal making with me less than a year earlier. <laughs> and they were shameless, though, about attacking me publicly for engaging in this deal making. And in fairness, part of my job did involve discreetly calling people up and saying, I need a one on one meeting, we need to talk. And most of the time, Nobody thought that was suspect. I mean, when I used to talk to people, including people with whom I had profound disagreements, when I called and said, I want to come down and see you, there's some things that we need to talk about, just the two of us. There was an understanding that perhaps some progress could get made. So I found in our community, at least at that level, nobody said, how dare you, that's immoral. You have anything to say to me, you say it at a public meeting. I never got that. I, I, I did not get that. So I think there needs to be an understanding of the need for... Under, for negotiating and engaging in public processes simultaneously. I think the importance of the regulators is something DOE has got to recognize at every site, that it's the regulators who have the legal enforcement authority. And the first relationship, the most important relationship, is that one. And making sure that DOE makes commitments to the regulators it can keep and then keeps them. Uh, I would say that openness is still a problem. That even at, during my tenure at Rock, I was actually surprised that issues of openness continued to come up in subtle ways, even toward the end of my tenure. And, and they were always on the margins. There was nothing uh, as overt as, oh, we have the safety report. Let's figure out some way to call it a classified report so we don't have to share it. That never happened. But it would be something like, well, there was this incident of bad news. And rather than affirmatively call up the community folks because we've agreed that anytime there's bad news, we'll call them first. Bad news like in the newspaper? No, no, bad news before it got to the newspaper. Oh, I see. Before okay. it got to the newspaper. It would be, oh, some minor thing. There would have been a spill or we had uh, an unverified report of an elevated uh, reading of plutonium somewhere or uh, something in the broad scheme of things relatively minor. But the argument is always, do we share what we know right away, even at the risk that one of the people we call shares it with a reporter and we get a bad press story? Or do we wait until we've done additional data gathering to figure out whether this is even a problem or not? Maybe the lab results are wrong. So you send it to another lab and get, it takes three days to uh, run through the results again, and it turns out it was a false positive. That tension continued to exist up until the very end of the Rocky Flat cleanup. That there were some people who said, no, let's wait. Why uh, get the bad story? Let's just wait it out. Perhaps nobody will notice. And somebody always notices. Rocky Flats is a sieve. I mean, uh, my rule of thumb was that by the time we were in the manager's office discussing how to deal with the story, the press already had it. <laughs> they already had it at that point. And so. The only question was whether people would hear about it from us first or whether the reporters would call the folks in the community first. I think that's an important, important lesson. But I think the other thing that, that's important on the flip side, because I don't want to uh, put it up the onus entirely on the Department of Energy, there is a profound question in my mind as to whether the communities surrounding the Department of Energy sites are prepared to negotiate in good faith. And negotiating in good faith means if an agreement is made and a commitment is made, feeling bound to honor it, even if folks in the community get heat for their agreement. Mm -hmm. And my experience, and you know, folks watching this who are from the communities will probably disagree violently, is that it was very rare that people in the community felt the need to deal fairly with the Department of Energy. They felt that it was legitimate and justified to break their word, break their commitment, uh, make commitments to us in private and then denounce them in public and, and this is as I think you said before this is as a result of the way that they perceived they were treated for the many years before about need to know or do you think the communities why would the communities behave that way maybe that's my question obviously that's a question you have to ask them and I'm sure they would start by denying they behave that way <laughs> That being said, I think there's a sense that th often they would state that they didn't recognize the consequence of what they had committed to. Mm -hmm. 
And to me, that's not really an excuse for breaking your commitment. Uh, that's, that goes to how well you negotiate to start with. I think there was a sense that they would get tricked, they would get manipulated by us. That we would uh, offer, an agree offer something and they would think they were getting a certain deal, but then we would pull one over on them. Uh, but I think that uh, that's a minor part of it. I think the bigger part is that if the question is protecting the health and safety of their citizens, then breaking their word and breaking their commitment to us is a minor sin. It's a minor offense. <laughs> and I think they would just sort of shrug their shoulders and say, well, our first priority is not to sleep well at night. <laughs> our first priority is to know that we've done everything we can to protect our citizens. And the other thing is that they would say is that independent of, independent of the history, the behavior of the Department of Energy as a bureaucracy shows that even if you assume the people you negotiate with intend to keep their agreements in good faith, they can't guarantee that something won't happen in Washington that'll force them to break their agreement. And so our priority is to, by any means necessary, get the best cleanup we can. <laughs> and if that means we agree to something and then later we hammer you on it, okay, so you get some bad press stories. So what? Two things will happen. Either you won't do what we want, in which case we're no worse off, or you do do what we want, in which case it turns out all that really means is that was negotiating by other means. <laughs> so I think that that's how they'd articulate it. They would say, uh, we just interpret that as the continuation of the negotiation process. And the problem with that is that that incentivizes the Department of Energy to not negotiate openly either. <laughs> there were people uh, who argued, I never bought this argument, but there were folks who argued that the smartest public strategy was to not negotiate, not do a public process, but simply put a decision document out without consulting anyone. Put it out for formal public comment because that's what the law requires. Wait till you get hammered. Wait to get all the pushback. And then meet the pushback halfway. And you're done. And that's the end of it. <laughs> In other words, put something out of the table that's absolutely preposterous. Let the community yowl at outrage and then accommodate them part of the way. Sounds a little bit like collective bargaining between union and management. Exactly, exactly. There were people at the Department of Energy who said that is the more smarter and more effective way to handle the community. And who always argued that my techniques were silly, a waste of time, counterproductive, and rolled their eyes whenever I walked into a room. Because they said, here comes Jeremy, so we're going to have lots more brain damage than we need. And all for nothing, because at the end of the day, he's never going to get these folks in the community to behave themselves. He's never going to get them to commit to anything. And so what's the point? So, <laughs> and I had to contend with that quite a, quite a bit. So kind of my, I guess my last big question to you is, were you successful? Do you think you were successful while you were there, creating I, this new way to deal? I, I, I'm not going to answer that because it's not appropriate for me to personalize the success of Rocky Flats. I think Rocky Flats was successful in part. I think Rocky Flats was able to get broader and deeper buy-in with a significant chunk of the community than appeared possible <clears throat> at the outset of the cleanup and that other sites have been able to achieve. Typically, there's a tension between making real decisions and getting real work done, which involves making choices on the one hand, and having support from the community on the other hand. It's typically, you can only do one at the expense of the other, and it's impossible to optimize both. And I think at Rocky Flats, we were able to achieve a fair amount of optimizing both. I don't want to suggest for a minute that it was the product only, or even mostly, of our public strategies. As I said at the very beginning, I think it had to do mostly with the substance of what we were doing. We did have a contractor committed to cleanup. We did have a contract vehicle that enabled that. We did have a federal staff that held their feet to the fire. We did have consistent federal funding. We did have a regulatory agreement that uh, enabled a, a unified and, consent and, and synthesized decision-making process. We did have folks at the regulatory agencies who shared our vision of trying to get a real cleanup accomplished. We did have political allies 
who were prepared to knock down barriers for it when we needed it. At critical moments, we did have external support from the rest of DOE. The opening of WIP, the disposition of the nuclear material, getting containers approved. I mean, there was so much that enabled the cleanup to move forward. And that is so much more important than anything I worked on as part of the public strategies. So I, I think that's very important to emphasize. If we had not had that, I mean, if we were constantly coming back to the regulators and saying, guess what, we're going to have to scale back our commitment, we never would have been able to achieve, just, uh, achieve trust with them. If we had to go back to the local governments and say, guess what, we're going to have to build a, uh, a facility to hold transuranic waste because it looks like WIP is never going to open. They would have gone bananas, the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico. Uh, if we had said, sorry, we were not able to get the trucks approved or to get the variances on this waste stream, so we're going to have to build a waste disposal site on site, we would have lost tremendous support. So I think in talking about how you achieve success with the community, you've got to back up a little bit. If you have a successful cleanup, it's a lot easier to have success with the community. And we had a successful cleanup. Now, obviously, the two reinforced each other. And a significant part of my job didn't involve the community. It involved putting together some of those political things that were, that were important for our success. So I feel good about those. But those were also on the margin. I mean, those were, I mean, yes, it was, one example is there was a certain stream of residues that we needed to get reclassified as waste so that it could go to WIP. And that saved us a huge amount of money and time. And I was involved in some of those discussions to enable that to happen, and it required legislation. Uh, the refuge designation was important, and I played a role in that. And there were other things. But everything that I was involved in, whether it involved what I like to call the air cover, the, the political uh, pieces in place that enabled us to get done, the community relationships, trying to be open and proactive with the media, all of those things helped, but they would have amounted to absolutely nothing if at its core we didn't have the mechanism of a successful cleanup going on. And we did, and that made my job possible. Well, I want to thank you so much for sharing your experiences um, with us at the museum. And um, we might call you again and ask you to talk some more. But <laughs> thanks very much. I think we are done, unless there's something else you'd like to say. Fine. Okay. Okay, we, um, we're back here just for a moment to clarify one particular part of our conversation. It has to do with the relationship between the communities and um, DOE and Rocky Flats and the way that um, both the powers that be interacted. Um, so if we could talk a little bit more about that. Sure, I, I, I might have come across as a bit too harsh in what I said earlier. The kind of partnership that we tried to achieve with the community by the end, in which we were only partly successful, is enormously compl complex and difficult for all the folks involved. The Department of Energy attempted to lay on the table the comprehensive set of decisions and actions related to the envi remaining environmental cleanup issues at the site, including the residual contamination in the soil and water. And we tried to engage the broad community both the folks we thought were critical to those decisions, but also people who perhaps weren't so critical. And what we expected of ourselves was to be able to provide the community with a comprehensive set of information and data that would enable them to understand the trade-offs in one decision and another, to understand how a unified risk approach would work, to understand a whole range of technical and policy issues and how they would relate. And we had enormous difficulty, both on the technical side, making that information available, but on the communication and policy side, presenting it in a way that enabled a dialogue among some folks who were non-experts about how to choose. We were really trying to set the stage for a broad-ranging negotiation on a very technical topic. And we didn't really know what we were getting into. And I think we bit off more than we could chew in some respects. On the community's end, we found it incredibly difficult to get the community to give us the kind of feedback we were looking for. We found that we often got inconsistent messages, inconsistent statements, often from the same people. And it was very frustrating to us. I'm sure it was frustrating to them as well. But it was very frustrating to us that 
we would be in a situation where we would think we had agreement on something and we'd attempt to move forward and then the next meeting we would discover that the agreement we thought we reached had disappeared. Sometimes it would be... Was it a matter of semantics? Was it a matter of... Um... Sometimes it was semantics. Sometimes it was substance. Sometimes it was we thought we had reached agreement that uh, this particular issue was a non-issue. That we would say, well, all right, uh, the new process waistlines were, are not really a concern. And we can take those off the table and focus on the old process waistlines, or the original process waistlines as they were referred to. Then we come back two weeks later prepared to talk narrowly about the original process waistlines. And we'd find that we were hammered on the new process waistlines once again. Now, we never knew what went on behind the scenes on that, so I can only speculate. Now, it was only frustrating when this would happen in one private meeting to the next private meeting. What got many of us incensed was when we reached agreement in a private meeting, and then only a few days later at a public meeting, we'd feel like we were attacked for things we thought we'd agreed to at the private meeting. Now, the level of tension around these things sometimes got very emotional, sometimes got very hot. But what's important to remember is that I can't remember a single instance once we finally got the decision done that whoever we had been fighting with still wasn't prepared to once or twice a year go to Washington and argue for full funding. The same people who accused us in private of being irresponsible and and breaking our word and you know far worse. I remember one, one instance, uh, the timing was just hilarious to me that one local government with whom we worked very closely but often said really bitter things to us privately and publicly. And after one particularly bitter exchange that just left us, left us feeling, this is hopeless. We just can't work with these people anymore. Two weeks later, we were invited by them to a lunch at a local restaurant because they were going to make their annual trip to Washington with the group of cities and wanted to know what specific requests they should make to Congress and to departmental headquarters on our behalf. And we were just left scratching our heads. I mean, does that mean that the nasty letter we got two weeks ago was just a fit of pique or doesn't represent their true interests? And the reality, of course, is they both represented their true interests. And on the one hand, they were furious at us for a particular decision. But on the other hand, they recognized there was still a fundamental commonality of interests that really transcended any anger over a particular decision. And I think the, the lesson for other sites is that on the one hand, I believe that the kind of comprehensive decision making that we tried to do and the comprehensive negotiating we tried to do is very difficult. And I'm not sure we succeeded entirely. I think we succeeded in part, uh, but not completely and not to my satisfaction. But I think other sites trying it need to do a better job than we did under anticipating the technical challenge, the communications challenge, and the negotiations challenge. And perhaps to try to establish some explicit negotiating ground rules in advance. Now, again, I'm not, no guarantee that that will be successful. And maybe the level of success we achieved is all anyone can ever reasonably hope for. Because at the end of the day, to be specific, there was a lot of yelling and screaming about cleanup levels. But at the end of the day, we did get a core of the community to agree that trading off more removal of contamination in the surface was worth potentially less removal in the deep subsurface. It doesn't mean we got a ringing endorsement. It doesn't mean we got a letter saying, you guys are terrific. But it did mean that the criticism and the anger we saw between 1997 and 2000 we didn't see between 2003 and 2005 on that issue. And that was something. That, that is some kind of achievement. I agree. Thank you very much.